Welcome, everyone. Welcome back to the program. It's your host, Danny Hai Fong. It is good to be back. Welcome, everyone, this evening. Thank you so much for tuning in, or this morning, or this afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. It's been a little bit of time. It's been quite a bit of time, actually, since I've been able to go live. So it's good to see all of you here now. So we have a packed show today. So first, just give me a quick sound check, okay? Give me a quick sound check. Let me know how I sound. Also, be sure to hit that like button that helps boost this stream in the YouTube algorithm. Or if you're on Rumble, welcome Rumble family. If you're on Rockfin, welcome Rockfin family. Do all of that, hitting the like button on all of those channels as well. Uh, Be sure also to hit the subscribe button if you're new here. And hit that notifications bell. And lastly, to support this channel, the best way to do so is to go to the video description and click on the link, patreon.com slash Danny Haifong. That is the best way to support this work. How do I sound? People say I sound good. All right, in the video description, you can find Substack, you can find PayPal, buy me a coffee, and many more options to support this work. So it's good to be with all of you today. Here is what we have tonight. I'm actually going to get into the stories right away. 
because we can have a, a good amount of time at the end to discuss announcements as well as take your questions, super chats, and all of that good stuff. So what we have on deck today is a breaking story about Yemen and Ansarallah granting access or at least giving assurance to Russia and China for safe passage in the Red Sea. I'm going to talk about those developments, the impact that Ansar Allah is actually having, especially in relation to Israel and how really Yemen has really been a game changer, in particular Ansar Allah, the leading force, not just in Yemen, but really right now in the whole global south in solidarity with Gaza. Then we are going to talk about Vladimir Putin's election victory, but we're not going to talk about it in any old way. We are going to put his victory in the context of a myriad of developments in Russia, as well as U.S. and Western mainstream media admissions that uh, Vladimir Putin is not only here to stay, but that the situation surrounding NATO's aim to contain Russia is crumbling. And we're going to get into that. And then lastly, we will talk about China. We will talk about the latest admission coming out of the Taiwan Authority government that it is indeed hosting U.S. military forces in the form of the Green Berets and what this means for the future of the region, especially the U.S.'s aim to contain and weaken China, destabilize China. We will get to all of that and much more and hopefully have some time to spare for your questions, super chats, and uh, uh, comments, etc. So it's going to be a packed show today, everybody. For everyone who's already here, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, hit the notifications bell, and go to the video description to find all the ways you can support this work. But let us get started. Let us get started with Yemen, all right? Because this is, when it comes to what's happening in Gaza, this is, in my opinion, the critical uh, just action that is going on around the world, which is really changing things in the region for the better and is really standing up to the United States, to Israel and their onslaught, uh, one of the few forces with the capabilities of doing so. And so it, it's it's uh, th this story will be a good one. So let let us get started. Yemen, in particular, on Sarala, has really been changing everything when it comes to West Asia. And of course, when we are talking about West Asia, we are mainly now talking about Israel's onslaught, its genocidal campaign in Gaza. And Yemen, in particular, on Sarala, the leading force in Yemen, has been doing the most when it comes to standing in solidarity with the people who are suffering so mightily, the Palestinian people who are suffering so mightily from this campaign. So since October, since uh, Israel decided to wage this genocidal campaign, Ansarallah has stepped up and, of course, enforced a blockade of the Red Sea. Of course, the Red Sea is one of the most important lifelines for all things world trade. And so this has had a huge impact on the global economy, but in particular, it has caused panic amongst the Western powers, the United States backing Israel. It has caused panic among these forces to the point where they had to come up with a, an operation, Prosperity Guardian, in order to stop Ansarala. And they have failed dramatically. The United States and its Western allies have been unable to stop the blockade. Indeed, it has only accelerated. So in recent days, okay, in recent days, we have had, okay, we have had, here's the Times of Israel confirming that the Ansarullah forces have launched a cruise missile that hit the Iliad port uh, this past Monday of March 19th. 2024. The Ansarallah claims to target a Marshall Islands flagged fuel tanker headed for Saudi Arabia as it passed through the Red Sea shipping route. The Israeli offense forces or occupation forces confirmed on Tuesday evening that a suspicious aerial target struck an open area near Iliad uh, that it, and this was a cruise missile. 
Yemen's Houthis or Ansarala claimed responsibility for the missile, which crossed an Israeli airspace from the direction of the Red Sea. So there's no damage or injuries. And according to the IDF, the missile was tracked by the Air Force throughout the incident. It marks the first time that a Houthi projectile hit Israeli territory. In previous attacks, missiles and drones launched from Yemen struck neighboring countries or intercepted by air defenses. The IDF said it is further investigating the incident. So they also targeted a fuel tanker in the Red Sea with naval missiles, says the group's military spokesperson, Yahya Sari, in a pre-recorded statement on Tuesday. So this Marshall Islands flagged liquefied petroleum gas tanker was heading to Singapore from Saudi Arabia. Maritime shipping tracker showed. The vessel was twice targeted by Houthi fire on March 15th and March 17th. Both attacks missed the vessels with neither damage nor injuries. But so while there wasn't any impact there, it is important to note that what Al Mayadeen has been saying, and the reason why this attack, and it comes in the context of, of the real the really huge development. That I wanted to get to. So Al Mayadeen, just this past day, so this is being recorded on March 21st, 2024. Here, the leader of Ansarallah, Saeed Abdul Malik Al Houthi, said that they have used a new missile that surprised the Israeli enemy and managed to reach Iliad, bypassing all the US and Israeli interception and surveillance systems. So that is. A big deal here. I'm going to just zoom that in here. So that was the breaking news coming from Al Mayadeen Lebanese media that the leader of the Yemeni forces said that they've used a new missile. This was the missile that hit Iliad, bypassing all the U.S. and Israeli surveillance and interception systems. So, of course, just a week before this, there were rumors that Yemen, that Ansarallah, has actually uh, come into hypersonic missiles it's unclear whether they have them or whether they have uh, received them from iran or russia that has not been verified but nonetheless this has had a major impact don't let the fact that this uh, uh iliot strike didn't hurt anyone today <laughs> that it didn't hurt anyone in that moment because we know from earlier this month of March 2024, that there has been damage done, right? So here's Reuters on March 3rd saying that the Houthis are going to continue to attack these ships, British ships, US ships, that is following the sinking. So they did sink the UK owned vessel Rubamar, um, and that that ship sunk uh, after being struck by an anti-ship ballistic missile fired by the Houthi militants or Ansarallah on February 18th, and that they're going to continue to do so. So there have been vessels damaged. There have been military targets, economic targets. This has caused a, a real shakeup in the region. And the United States, of course, with its so-called allies in the West, have failed in their strikes. They're waging war on Yemen right now to try to prevent this. They have failed dramatically to prevent Ansarallah from continuing what it is doing. So I want to show you before I get to the big news around this issue, I want to show you exactly how dramatic the impact has been, especially for who is actually being targeting, targeted here. And who is that? It's Israel, right? Israel is launching this campaign in Gaza, wildly unpopular around the world, causing massive suffering for the Palestinian population. And here you have the Times of Israel reporting that they have are going to have to lay off half of the workers in Eliot Port amid the Red Sea shipping crisis on Sarala's blockade. Half the workers at Eliot Port are on the verge of losing their jobs after the seaport took a major financial hit due to the crisis in the Red Sea shipping lanes, says Israel's main labor federation. Iliad sits on a northern tip of the Red Sea and was one of the first ports to be affected as shipping firms rerouted vessels to avoid attacks by the Houthis in Yemen. 
The Histor.Labor Federation, the umbrella organization for hundreds of thousands of public sector workers, says port management has announced it intends to fire half of 120 employees. The dock workers will hold a protest later today on this. Officials at the port did not immediately respond for comment. Iliat, which primarily handles car imports and, pot and potash exports coming from the Dead Sea, pales in, in size compared to Israel's Mediterranean ports, which handle nearly all the country's trade. But Iliat, which sits adjacent to Jordan's only coastal access point at Aqba, offers Israel a gateway to the east without the need to navigate the Suez Canal. And that Iliat's port chief has told Reuters that 85% a drop has been seen in trade activity since the Houthis began their attacks. So this port has essentially become irrelevant. And that has had a major impact on Israel's economy, and rightfully so, because Israel is facing a blockade not so dissimilar to what South Africa faced during the, uh, uh, during the apartheid regime there. But this time, though, uh, there is a massive genocide underway at the same time. So the Houthis on Sarala has answered the call in the biggest way possible. They have been, since the very beginning, using everything that they have, and mind you, socially, economically, it isn't much because Ansarallah and, and in particular Yemen, th this force in this country, happen to be living in a nation that has been under fire for many, many, many years, over a decade by U.S.-sponsored Saudi Arabia and other forces in the region, including uh, the United States illegally occupying the region in many ways all over the uh, all over West Asia, but it has faced war for over a decade and now is standing up to another war, this time Israel's. So with all of that, you would think, well, doesn't this apply? This blockade apply to everyone? Doesn't it apply to all countries using the Red Sea, this wildly important trade hub uh, for energy and all kinds of goods and products that need to reach the rest of the world, that need to reach the European market, that need to reach uh, all across Asia? Well, no, it does not apply to Russia and China. And Bloomberg is reporting this is the breaking news coming out of uh, uh, coming out of the Red Sea. The breaking news, is that Yemen, Ansarallah, has given assurance to Russia and China, and here's the Bloomberg report, that Yemen's Houthis tell China and Russia their ships won't be targeted. The Houthis have reached an understanding on safe passage during Oman talks. The move signals world powers' as nervousness about maritime attacks. And there's the Rubamar, uh, the British vessel, uh, a photo of it sinking after on Sarala's attack. So the report says the Yemen-based Houthis have told China and Russia their ships can sail through the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden without being attacked, according to several people with knowledge of the militant group's discussions. China and Russia reached an understanding following talks between their diplomats in Oman and Mohammed Abel Salam, one of the Houthis' top political figures, said the people who asked not to be named discussing private matters. In exchange, the two countries may provide political support to the Houthis and bodies such as the UN Security Council, according to the people. It's not entirely clear how that support would be manifested, but it could, in, could include blocking more resolutions against the group. Spokespeople for the governments of China and Russia, as well as the Houthis, including Abel Salam, didn't reply to Bloomberg's request for comment. So again, take this with a grain of salt, because neither the Russian government, neither its envoys, its officials, or the Chinese have confirmed these reports. But nonetheless, I'll show you why that it's highly likely to be true, whether or not this is something that's happening now or whether this is simply a verification of a longstanding policy. I'll get to that in a second. So Houthi attacks near the Bab el-Mendev Strait, the Iran, so-called Iran-backed group, that's what they always say about Ansarallah, have attacked multiple commercial and military ships in the southern Red Sea in the Gulf of Aden since mid-November. While the Houthis have already signaled Moscow and Beijing's assets would not be targeted, the talks underscore the increased nervousness among world powers about the group's missile and drone attacks in and around the southern Red Sea since mid-November. The Houthis and Islamist groups say they're targeting ships linked to Israel, the U.S., and the U.K., yet they appear had to have misidentified some vessels, and Russia and China may have wanted stronger assurances from the group. 
This month, the Houthis hit the True Confidence, a bulk commodities carrier, causing the first deaths since they started their maritime attacks. The Houthis said the vessel was American. It used to be owned by Los Angeles-based Oak Tree Capital, according to a person with knowledge of the matter, but a new non-U.S. company has taken it on. Separately, missiles exploded near a ship hauling Russian oil near Yemen in late January. It happened a few days after a spokesperson for the Houthis told the Russian newspaper that Russian and Chinese merchant ships need not fear attacks. So again, this is about reassurances. And it makes a lot of sense that there would need to be reassurances because for all of uh, Ansarallah's capabilities, for all of Yemen's capabilities, of course, this is not something that is easy to verify. And so mistakes are made. And indeed, mistakes could have been made in this process. But again, all of this is hard to verify given the propensity for the Western mainstream media to smear on Sarala. Ostensibly, the assaults are to put pressure on Israel to stop its war in Gaza against uh, Hamas, which is not what this is about, but this is what they say it's about, though many analysts doubt the Houthis would end their campaign in the event of a ceasefire permanent peace deal, which, again, that's the propaganda here. They're trying to tell you that Ansarallah is the aggressor when really they are responding to an actual genocide uh, um, against uh, a majority Arab population in Gaza, <laughs> the Palestinian people. And mind you, there's no reason to believe they wouldn't stop if it were to stop, right? But this is how they, the mainstream media curries favor for Israel's war. The waterways, including the Bab el Mendev Strait connecting the Red Sea and Gulf of Aden, are crucial for the global economy, and normally around 30% of container cargo flows through them. They also handle a large proportion of oil and liquefied natural gas flows. Since the attack started, most Western shipping firms have avoided the strait and are instead going around Southern Africa. That's adding days and significant freight costs, mind you, hundreds of thousands of dollars sometimes <clears throat> for one trip onto these journeys between Asia and Europe. Companies from China and Russia haven't announced they're avoiding the area, and ship tracking data shows many of them still send their ships through them. So here they're just going to talk about how China is and Russia are diplomatic and economic partners of Iran. And here they still say that the Ansarallah retains plenty of independence from Iran, despite the fact that they're always calling them Iran backed. It says they support the Houthis, Iran does but they make their own decisions on political and military affairs. All right. So they talk about they survived the bombings and all of that. The main news here, though, the bombings from Saudi Arabia, et cetera. But the main news here is that Russia and China have struck a deal with Ansar Allah, or at least reportedly so, that demonstrates another assurance for Russia and China, that their ships won't be targeted. And why is that? Well, it's because it's Russia and China uh, who is not participating in this bloody campaign that Israel's waging in Gaza right now. It's the United States. It's the collective West. It is all ships affiliated with them. They are the ones who are participating. So they are the ones who are suffering the brunt of this blockade. Now, I want to show you, though, that this isn't necessarily a, um, a new development. As Bloomberg said, and here is a report from Voice of America from earlier this year. It says, Ansarallah Houthis won't target Chinese and Russian ships in the Red Sea. So this is from the CIA, uh, essentially, mouthpiece. Voice of America. So the Ansarallah said that Chinese and Russian vessels will have safe passage through the Red Sea, said Mohammed al Bukhaidi, a member of the political leadership of the group, said in an interview with the Russian outlet uh, Izvestia that the shipping lanes around Yemen are safe for ships uh, uh, from China and Russia as long as those vessels aren't connected with Israel. They said that they're acting in solidarity with Palestinians amid the war against Hamas militants in Gaza and have carried out more than 30 attacks in the Red Sea. So that was in January. More attacks have occurred since there. So since then. So the Red Sea route is vital for shipping between Europe and Asia, carrying about 15% of the world's maritime traffic. So again, this is not necessarily a new policy, but it's one that is being verified by and validated 
by the uh, Ansarallah forces with Russia and China. And why is this so huge? Well, for one, it means that given that the Elliott port was reached, given that there are also reports that Yemen, the Ansarallah forces, have reached the Indian Ocean as well, targeting cargo and tankers, etc. It's quite clear that Ansarallah has pretty significant capabilities. And it's also quite clear that they're not stopping, that the United States, Operation Prosperity Guardian, and all of the Western vassal states that joined in can't halt what Yemen, what Ansarallah is doing. They can't halt their black blockade. This blockade is going to continue, and it's likely going to escalate given that now Yemen in a first, this is the first time that Yemen and Ansarallah has targeted Israel directly. So it's likely that this is going to escalate. And so it was important, obviously, for Russia and China to get assurances that it wasn't going to be their ships that were going to be targeted, whether mistakes happen or they don't. Russia and China are continuing to use the Red Sea for trade. So they're also uh, perhaps in front of the show, Pepe Escobar uh, did intimate uh, such that there's also the possibility, okay? Here's what Pepe Escobar had to say on Twitter, all right? Pepe Escobar said the Houthi-China-Russia triad is immense with the deal reached in Oman. Not only are they defeating the lassocracy, they have Russia-China strategic partnership on their side. The empire moves its puny pawn, fr puny pawn France, Russia and China counterattack with Ansarallah. That's how you play chess. The Houthis assured Beijing and Moscow their ships can sail through the Bab el-Mendeb, Red Sea, and Gulf of Adan with no problems. In exchange, Russia and China offer political support. The road is paved for Yemen to be considered as a serious candidate for the next BRICS Plus expansion in October in Kazan. So again, the implications of this could be even more immense than just this blockade continuing. It means that Yemen has the support of Russia and China that these two forces are not going to go against Yemen's political stand. And that gives the rest of the region an opportunity also to continue to take a stand in support of Gaza. And believe me, right now, Gaza needs all the support it can get. And it is getting it. It's not a hopeless situation. As terrible as things are, as the United States is rubber stamping, there are no red lines on Israel. Rafa is under assault. Uh, they're raiding hospitals still in the north. I take it as the fact that Israel still has to fight in the north as a clear sign that Israel is not achieving its so-called military objectives, that all it is doing is massacring the population. But you have over and over again, you have a reports. I think the Islamic resistance in Iraq has struck an electrical grid inside of Tel Aviv. You have uh, uh, increased missile fire from Hezbollah to the north with Israeli military forces, uh, Israeli defense minister, etc., all talking about a broader war with Hezbollah because they know that it's untenable for the situation in the so-called north of Israel to maintain the current situation as it is because it is a losing one. So Israel knows that its campaign, despite how it looks in terms of optics. Most of the world are, is paying attention and rightfully so to the massive suffering being incurred with the hubris on the side of the so-called pro-Israel forces, the United States, the empire's forces, the collective West. They're all thumping their chest saying, well, well, Israel's winning. Well, on the other side, you have people who support Palestine and rightfully so looking at this saying, well, Palestinians could not be losing any more than they are now. But I want to put out there that whether it's Hezbollah, whether we're talking about the Islamic resistance, but whether and also whether we're talking about Yemen, when we're looking at all these forces together in the axis of resistance, we are seeing a really, uh, I think, steadfast and pretty mighty and powerful campaign in solidarity with Gaza that is having a real tangible impact on Israel, on the world economy, on the forces that are attempting to subdue and suppress the self-determination of the Palestinian people and really of the entire region, because that's what this is about, full stop at the end of the day. So we have to look 
at what Yemen is doing with, I think, uh, 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 bright eyes, with the understanding that this is not going to stop. This is something we need to be actually in support of because the pressure, right, the propaganda campaign, the labeling and smearing of Ansarullah is just bandits as people who are just terrorists, who have no ideals. You heard Bloomberg themselves sneak in there that they believe that Ansarullah is simply uh, going to refuse to stop its blockade if the campaign in Israel, if the campaign in Gaza is uh, stopped, if there is a ceasefire, that it wouldn't be enough and that they would continue to keep going. Well, right now, Yemen is at war. Yemen has been essentially invaded. There are U.S. forces, uh, special forces operating in Yemen. There are uh, uh, attacks by the air uh, regularly against Yemen by the so-called coalition. And uh, uh, the assault on Gaza continues. So Yemen is, is at war. It's taken a stance. Much of the region, the axis of resistance at least, has taken a stance. And it is those forces that have not, which continue to allow uh, the motive force of history to be dictated by Israel and really by the United States, by an invading force, a foreign entity, an imperial force. That is what is at stake here in Yemen. Yemen, Yemen, a country that has been so stripped and stolen of its wealth, of its capacity for economic development, has been so impoverished as well as so violently assaulted and terrorized by foreign forces for so many decades, but in particular the last 10 years, it is Yemen that has answered the call for Gaza, and now it has hit Israel on Israeli, so-called Israeli territory, and it has assured Russia and China safe passage through the Red Sea indefinitely, setting up a political nightmare for the empire that the United States in particular was not expecting until the October 7th military campaign from Hamas was launched. It was not expecting to have to relaunch a military assault uh, or escalate a military assault in the Middle East, in West Asia, as it has had to do since then. And uh, this quagmire is going to get a lot deeper for the United States, for Israel, and uh, we would be remiss, we would be mistaken to bet against Yemen and to bet against the acts of resistance in the final analysis because history is on their side. They are on the right side of history. And this blockade will be a big part of turning the tide regionally and globally, not just on the side of the Palestinian people, but on the broader arc and broader course of justice. So that's the first story, everyone. Thanks so much for tuning in. Please be sure to continue to hit that like button. Um, we are going to get to the next story right quick very soon. Okay. Uh, hit that like button. Hit that subscribe button. Hit that notifications bell. And of course, please do consider supporting this program on Patreon at patreon.com slash Danny Highfall. It's the best way to support. But there are many other ways in the video description from... Uh, uh, there's a uh, Substack, PayPal, buy me a coffee, you can become a YouTube member here. All of it goes back into this channel. All right, everybody, we have another story. We're going to talk about Putin's election victory, okay? And we're going to talk about the, the significance of this election victory because it is massively significant, mind you, really significant, okay? Um, so let's get to it. Vladimir Putin won the presidential election in Russia by a large margin, 
Okay, a huge margin. All right. Uh, the presidential election in Russia was predicted from the start. It was no secret that Vladimir Putin was going to win. And it was no secret that the election that was held from the 15th to the 17th across Russia, including the Russian territories, was heavily influenced by what's going on in Ukraine and what's happening between Russia, Ukraine, and NATO. So Vladimir Putin won over, I believe it was over 88, 87% of the total vote. 70 plus percent of the electorate came out. Vladimir Putin actually did better in the territories that have been supposedly stolen from Ukraine. If you listen to the Western mainstream media, but in places like Donetsk, uh, they, uh, the people came out in droves for Vladimir Putin. And so the election of Vladimir Putin, of course, was no surprise, no shock, really. But what should come as a surprise is the context from which this comes out of, this victory comes out of, in particular, the fact that over the last several weeks, we've had, especially Emmanuel Macron, French president, talk about over and over again, sending troops to Ukraine in order to fight Russia being a possibility. And over the course of this period, the last several weeks, we've also seen attacks on Belgorod. We've seen uh, a, a, a step up in the campaign to try to smear Vladimir Putin and try to undermine the political process there. Of course, you had the whole Navalny incident where uh, uh, Alexei Navalny uh, died. And now there is an attempt to resurrect the uh, defeated, mightily defeated opposition to Vladimir Putin, or at least the Western-backed opposition to Putin. All of this was happening, and yet the election went off without a hitch, no problems. There were international observers, some of them friends of mine, uh, who went there, Dan Kovalik and others, who validated and verified the results of this election. And we've had something shocking happen, okay? We have had the Western mainstream media come out of this with a newfound uh, degree of awareness about what the situation is for Russia and why Vladimir Putin is here to stay. Before we get to that, I want to play you, friend of the show, Scott Ritter, he did a report for Sputnik, because I think this is where we need to start. Vladimir Putin's election is not just a victory for Russia and the Russian people, because it was their will. They voted for Putin, and Putin won dramatically. But it was also a victory for the multipolar world, and that Russia's future within this multipolar world is massively important. It is, is incredibly important, if not the most important in many areas and degrees, especially when it comes to this valiant effort to uh, uh, to stave off and, and beat back the NATO advance, the unipolar advance, the imperial advance of the collective West. So here's what Scott Ritter had to say. I think this is a good segue into what we're going to get into, the fact that now we see the Western mainstream media catching up. Now, what can we expect going forward? I think if you take a look at the lead up to this election, uh, the, the Russian government was in the process of redefining Russia. We had a um, new foreign policy passed last summer that, you know, categorized Russia as a major civilization of significance, um, that Russia had a goal of being self-sufficient, that Russia would never again allow itself to be dragged down uh, in the dark abyss that existed in the 1990s. Uh, this is a new Russia. Now, is Russia just going to continue to sustain the same policies over the course of the next year, six years? Probably not. Look, Vladimir Putin is 71 years old. He's healthy, he's vibrant, um, and no one questions his fitness to continue to rule. And he'll probably be just as fit to rule in six years. But then what? Does he seek another six-year election? Or does he seek to transition to the next generation of Russian leaders? And I believe that that's what we're going to see in the next six years. We're going to see a Russia in transition, a Russia that continues to redefine itself 
both in terms of how it interfaces with the world. We're talking about a multipolar world, not just, you know, it's, it's, it's a brave new world. Russia is a leader in the BRICS movement. Russia is the chairman of the BRICS movement. Uh, we see a vibrant Russian economy that's going to redefine how it integrates uh, with the global economy. I think you're going to see um, Vladimir Putin overseeing a more vibrant Russia, a Russia that's looking forward, a Russia that redefines itself, a Russia that introduces new blood into the political mix. It's going to be an exciting time for Russia, and the Russians are excited about it. And that's why so many of them went to the polls to vote for this president, not because it was just a vote in support of Vladimir Putin, but the most important part, it was a vote in support of Russia. Now, so that's exactly right. I mean, uh, that's exactly right. This is what Vladimir Putin's leadership means to Russia. It means coming out of the catastrophe that was the fall of Soviet Union, coming out of that nearly decade-long period of disaster where Russia was at its most indignified in a pressed position, and then coming out of that over the last two decades and uh, uh, surging forward in a recovery of the economy, uh, lifting the standards of living for the vast majority of people, and then also embarking on a campaign of defending Russia's sovereignty in a period where it has never been under threat any more than now, where NATO is literally threatening, literally threatening World War III on a, on a regular basis, and the conflict in Ukraine could not be any more emblematic of this. So, Russia now is not just defending Russia, it's defending the entire multipolar world from which it leads and which it takes a leadership position within. And the economy is a very good point. And I just want to bring this up really quick. I'm not going to read this article in full, but here you have China learning lessons. You have Ding Yi Fan, who's a senior development at the center of the state council in the Taihe Institute in China, saying that there are four counter sanction strategies that China can learn from Russia. So this is an excerpt, and I'll leave it in the show notes. This is an excerpt of an article written by this professor on what China can learn from Russia. So here you see that uh, Ch Russia's success is bigger than Russia, is much bigger than Russia. And that's why the Russian people in particular have voted for Vladimir Putin in such a wide uh, margin, such wide numbers. Now, I want to show you how. While Scott Ritter, friend of the show, uh, a superb geopolitical analyst, understands this, uh, in their own crude and maybe distorted way, the mainstream media is starting to understand this. And here in particular, I want to bring up a few articles. Uh, for one, here you have the Washington Post. Now, Belgorod has been pummeled, has been attacked. All right. And this was this was written on the eve of the election as the eves of eve of the votes being cast. And here you have in Belgrade, the Russian city hit hardest by the war. Putin is still running strong. Now, mind you, Ukrainian forces, as well as so-called armed groups affiliated with uh, uh, affiliated, they say, with Kiev, have been attacking Belgorod for many months now, all throughout this conflict. And of course, Belgorod is Russian territory. So here I'm just going to read a, a bit of this because it shows how even in their direct encounters with the people in Belgorod, the Russians, they are in complete support of Vladimir Putin. For most Russian voters, Putin's two-year-old war in Ukraine remains largely unseen, except on state-controlled television or social media. But in Belgorod, a regional capital near the Ukrainian border, they feel the war firsthand as it faces near-daily attacks. For four days this week, the city's air defenses struggled to intercept barrages of rockets and explosive drones. They say struggled, but they were intercepted. While east and south of Belgorod, the Russian army battled anti-Kremlin militias, which mounted assaults along the border, aiming to portray Putin as unable to protect his country as he prepares to claim a fifth term in office. So, mind you, Russia wiped those forces off the map. <laughs> that happened really soon after the election. There's little sign that this effort is succeeding. So this is the important part. And for many residents, such attacks only deepen their support for Putin and drive home the narrative, they say a false narrative from the Russian government, that Russians are victims in the war, not the perpetrators. I mean, how, 
how just absolutely disgusting do you have to be in the Washington Post to to write about this conflict in this way? But we should not be surprised. So cities across Ukraine are bombarded far more than Belgorod with Russian weapons that are far more powerful, including ballistic and hypersonic missiles. So there you go. They're they're saying that resulting civilian casualties are far higher. Which one is it? Usually it's Russian forces. And I'll show you later. <laughs> this is the case. Russian forces are the ones who are losing the most. Anyway, we go on. This is the conversation, some of the conversations they had at the Washington Post with, with people in Belgorod, Russians in Belgorod. So they said Yana and Mikhail uh, uh, Mikachuk were getting ready to leave their home to vote on Friday morning uh, when their living room erupted in a cloud of dust and glass as a rock exploded next to their apartment building. These you-know-whats are hammering us, but they can't scare me. I'll just make myself wake up again tomorrow and go and vote for Putin, said Yana. The drama of the morning was behind them, and they said Putin loves his country. He does everything for us. He raised the country up from the ground. So (laughs) that's definitive proof. They are proving uh, the point that Scott Ritter and I make all the time on this program. Even as residents of Grav uh, of Gravaron, a border town, started to evacuate in Belgorod, close schools, restaurants, and shops, the voting continued, part of an effort by officials to so- show the situation is under control. So there you have it. They're, they're only voting because the situation, the government wants to sh- show that things are under control, not because people want to vote, even though they just said that there are people who want to vote despite the war. Today and throughout the three days of voting, it's important for us to show the whole world our unity, said the government governor, uh, 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 Vyacheslav uh, Gladkov. So the neighbor, Lola Muslimova, said she planned to vote for Putin. I don't see a better candidate than our current president. He is managing the situation the best he can. In Ukraine, they are all brainwashed and the rest is pr- West is pressuring as hard as they can. So... Here's more. So a medic in Belgorod's territorial defense forces wearing a mask said the attacks made him more motivated to fulfill civic duty. I was never really a political person. I never voted before, speaking on anonymity because he was not authorized to talk to news media. But now I'm going out to vote out of principle. So according to a member of Belgorod City Council, Vadim Rachenko, the effect is the opposite. Ukraine's strategy to so-called disrupt the vote and stoke anger at Moscow. When Russians are faced with terrorist activities, they do not give up. And as a border city that has repelled external attacks since history or throughout history, there is a sense in Belgorod that we have a whole country behind us. It's genetic. So they're literally admitting the Washington Post that Vladimir Putin has support in Belgorod in a massive way. And mind you, the Washington Post wants to do everything it can to show that Russia does not have support. They're still painting this election. They're still painting the Russian government in this light that this was all staged, that the Russian people did not have a choice, that they are all brainwashed. That's how we are here. That's what we are hearing from the Western mainstream media all the time. So here is Politico. Politico also had an interesting opinion piece after the election. Putin's going nowhere. The West needs to get a grip. Don't think social media memes or clever stunts will topple Putin. And here you go. Here's the kicker. Only a defeat in Ukraine can do that. And so if it's by any estimation, such a conclusion should garner. We should be aware that that conclusion means that Putin really is going nowhere because Ukraine cannot win this conflict. So here... uh, Wishing something were true doesn't make it so. This is Jamie Detmer of Politico Europe. He's the opinion editor. He said, for the past two years, we've had a plethora of predictions suggesting Russian President Vladimir Putin's days are numbered. Russians will turn on him or that he'll be ousted in a Kremlin coup by oligarchs and Russia's elite, now targeted by Western sanctions and angry at their frozen overseas asset. Even Mikhail Kasyanov, Putin's prime minister from 2000 to 2004 had confidently predicted that the president's grip on power could slip abruptly. In three or four months, I believe there will be a crucial change. That's what he said in back in 2022. Another recurring narrative is that Putin's afflicted with a fatal malady. He has been sick for a long time. He has cancer. I think he will die very quickly. Hope very soon. That was the head of Ukraine's military intelligence, Kirill Budinov. So here we have 
him secure 87% of the vote, and he's massively pro- popular. <laughs> so here they say, okay, the opposition's coming back. You have Yulia Navalny, the widow of the CIA's opposition leader, saying, we will win. But when? Yes, when? So now we have the fact there he's he's lamenting, right? He talks about how Putin is now saying Navalny's name because the Russian opposition is so weak. Right. There is no innovative geniuses coming around the bend when it comes to Russia's uh, minute and tiny uh, pro-Western opposition. There's no clever memes that are going to help. Right. They they try. There was a noon against Putin protest that went nowhere to try to force people to vote another direction or convince them, as they would say. So none of this is working. Okay. None, but they do offer. This is what is so interesting. Okay, what is so interesting about this is that there isn't cooperation amongst Russia's opposition, and <laughs> what's so interesting is that they are calling for war, right? Not just Russia's opposition, so-called uh, pro-Western opposition, but this piece in and of itself. Is saying, however violent or peaceful, Russia's opposition seems an irrelevance no matter how much it's talked up by commentators in the West. Russia's pro-democratic opposition was largely a spent force even before 2022 of February, said the Center for European Policy Analysis. And so while many of these individuals continue to fight abroad and play important roles in helping refugees in Ukraine and smuggling intelligence, what does all this mean for the West given that it's so weak? It means that Russia's defeat in Ukraine is the only realistic goal. This is what they're saying. This is what the opinion editor at Politico is saying about Putin, that Putin is so strong. They have to admit that he is so supported in Russia that the only way to defeat Putin would be to defeat Russia in Ukraine. Now, that is <laughs> that is a pipe dream. That is a real pipe dream, okay? For such a victory to be achieved, the West has to gird itself, he says, accelerate weapons provision and military assistance and help Ukraine weather the soon-to-come Russian offenses, offensives that will target likely Kharkov and Odessa as well as build up for another heave and try to push. So basically, they had to prepare for another heave and push Russia out. So that's it. If Russia loses, it will undergo a transformation inside. If it wins, it will dominate Europe. They're literally saying the quiet part out loud of what they have wanted to do since the very beginning. But now they're saying it not with the confidence of a superpower that is ready to take on the uh, Russian government and its military. They're saying it really as a defeated force. And it gets worse because it isn't just that they know the situation is much better for Vladimir Putin than they would like to admit, the collective West. That's not all. It's also the fact that they are, and I'm not going to read this whole piece, but they're also admitting more and more that the battlefield situation is just untenable, that it is not going well. Symbolism or strategy, says the New York Times, Ukraine battles to retain small gains. Retain small gains. Despite American doubts, Ukrainians say that defending places with little strategic value is worth the cost and casualties and weapons because the attacking Russians pay an even higher price. What did I say? Which one is it? Is it that you <laughs> that um, Russians are in, in, you know imposing massive casualties, military and civilian on Ukraine? Or is it that Ukraine uh, is inflicting massive casualties onto Russia? You never really know what the Western mainstream mean. It could be either one. It could be both at the same time. So this is where their narrative begins to collapse. So I'm not going to read this whole piece. I'm actually going to go to a part that I highlighted here. Okay. So where is that piece that I highlighted? Oh, it looks like it got unhighlighted. So um, here we go. So we're talking about Robotino, right? Robotino. So this small village, this small city has been um subject to just intense fighting and 
Ukraine has treated it like Bakhmut and Avdiivka, which Ukraine lost in, in both regards. So anyway, Robotine, which had a pre-war population of 500 people, is now in ruins. Throughout the war, American officials have repeatedly raised concerns that Ukraine was holding out too long in defending such places, committing soldiers and ammunition to cling to devastated towns with little strategic value. But for Ukraine, the area around Robotine remains worth fighting for, at least for now. At some point, symbolic becomes strategic, says Yuri Sack, a former advisor to the Minister of Defense, said of the fighting. Defense, defending the gains of the offensive, he said, is important for morale. It's important for the support of the population. It's important for the inner belief in our potential to win. So they're talking about their strate- the symbolic being now strategic. The combat is also more costly and casualties for Russians and Ukrainians in their defensive positions, Sack said. As long as the calculus continues, it supports holding the ground. It's war, so casualties are inevitable on both sides. That's what they think. This is what they truly think, despite the fact that here, here's the next three kind of reality check paragraphs because they're about to contradict themselves. Russia is now offensive on the offensive along the entire front line, which stretches in a 600-mile-long crescent from the Russian border northeastern Ukraine to the southern Dnieper River. The Kremlin's military has been using its advantage in ammunition, manpower, in aviation. There is a reality check right there. Russia has swelled the ranks of its army by deploying squads of former convicts, they say, as if that's all that's joining the Russian military. It's buying artillery shells, missiles, and exploding drones from DPRK in Iran to help replenish supplies. Its planes avoid Ukrainian air defenses by dropping bombs from a safe distance that glide to their targets, dropping nearly 3,500 glide bombs that Ukraine's military has admitted. Moscow's electronic warfare instruments jam signals and scramble coordinates for Ukraine's satellite-guided weapons. The result has been a grinding advance and in February pushed Ukraine out of Avdiivka. Since then, Russia has been attacking with a combination of ground assaults and aerial bombing at seven points along the front, according to Ukraine's general staff headquarters. Russian forces are now pushing through pine forests through the city of Kumpiansk in the Oskil River, seeking to reverse gains Ukraine made in the counteroffensive in the fall 2022. So what does that all point to? The symbolic is now strategic, meaning they're doomed. Ukraine is doomed on the battlefield. Every They, they, they want to continue to say that Russia is inflict, inflicting or being inflicted upon it more casualties, more losses that Ukraine is holding on. But then they will say just straight up that they are losing and they're losing badly. But it gets even worse than this. Okay, Uh, it it really is a total collapse happening in Ukraine while Vladimir Putin's position couldn't be any stronger. Here you have Ukrainska Pravda. Okay, Ukrainian media saying that Zelensky's servant of the people faction is close to disorganization due to a lack of motivation. And what they're saying here is that de jure currently has 235 MPs. This is Zelensky's party. Around 170, 180 of them regularly attend parliamentary meetings and participate in voting. The rest have either openly split off like the 17 MPs in Ruzumkov's group or routinely miss meetings. The Pravda source noted that the Ukrainian president's office and and parliament are at odds. Here's some quotes. There's a misunderstanding between the president's office and the parliament. The office despises the parliament. They think the servants will vote for whatever comes up since Zelensky brought them to power. Yes, he did. So what? We've endured two full years of full-scale war. Therefore, the old interaction model no longer works. We need to change something. Everyone is tired of the war. Secondly, many strict restrictions have been imposed, such as a ban on foreign business trips. Thirdly, MPs have no, that means they want to run away. Uh, Thirdly, MPs have no influence on the state of affairs and therefore on the state's affairs and therefore no longer see their role in the parliament and the point of being there. That is a huge one. They no longer have an influence on the state's affairs. Why? Well, Zelensky would say it's martial law and they need to consolidate. But the truth is, is that Ukraine has been turned into, and it has always been since the coup in 2014, has been transformed into a literal puppet state. Essentially, these members of parliament are claiming that Zelensky has total control and that they're not even, they don't, they don't even really belong. They don't have any reason to believe that they need to participate. Okay. And here's a quote from one of the service MPs, relatively speaking, individual MPs are saying things like, let me go. I've been offered a managerial position at a factory and a salary of 8,000 US dollars. I need to provide for my family and somehow grow on a personal level. I've heard such conversations many times. So 
the, the government is just, it's not a popular government. That's why they refuse to hold elections. Putin held an election during wartime. Ukraine, not holding elections during wartime. And there is many reasons for this. But the biggest one is that Zelensky would not be voted back. Zelensky, Zelensky would not win, lest the United States would have to manipulate the results. And that would look incredibly bad, especially when it comes to to Ukraine's golden boy image that they have tried to maintain, albeit <laughs> with uh, many failures all along the way. But you not only have this, okay, you have Ukraine just is, is, is has no friends, okay? <laughs> Ukraine is not just in a position where it's leadership, okay? And so here is the secretary uh, uh, of the National Security and Defense Council, uh, uh, Mr. Danilov. Okay, he is a rabid. He is a fascist. This this gentleman is a fascist. This is why he has a blurred background because you probably would see uh, right sector and, and all kinds of other uh, uh, paraphernalia of the NAZI variety. But uh, Mr. Danilov has many times shown why Ukraine doesn't have any friends, and here is why. So once again. Ukraine, uh, Alexei Danilov has lashed out at China. And what did he say to uh, Ukrainian media? And this is commenting on Beijing's proposal for peace talks with Russia. So as for Li Hui, this is the envoy, I want to remind, no one will decide our fate without us. We will not allow anyone, no country without us, without the will of our people, decide anything there. If someone thinks that we should get rid of our territory, get rid of our sovereignty, give yours. We are not going to give ours in, uh, to anyone, and we will not. I don't understand who can take our territories, our lands, and throw them away like this. Because to some hui, he vulgarly disordered his surname. I apologize, surname is inserted there or someone else there. It seemed that they should decide this. It will be decided by the people of Ukraine, led by the president. Our position is quite simple and clear. The Russian troops must leave Ukraine. After that, we will start talking about something. So Danilov essentially insulted uh, uh, China's envoy, Li Hui. And there are some rumors that he insulted him in a manner that if you look at a translation in Ukrainian or Russia, it meant something very vulgar. He said his name in a different pronunciation and a Russian-Ukrainian pronunciation that could very well mean, um, let's just say, a body part I will not name on Twitter. I mean, <laughs> on YouTube. All right. He's done this before, though. Okay. So he's done this before. Here he is. In, in, you know, from months back, the people of India and China, Asians in general, have less intellectual capacity, less humanity, less culture than we Ukrainians do. Russians are Asians and Asians have a way inferior and way less culture than us. They have less humanity, too. That's our key difference from the Russian. That's what Alexei Danilov said. OK, the head of the Defense Council of Ukraine. This was back in 2023 in the fall. So. Ukraine doesn't have any friends. It has been isolated. It has been destroyed. It has been made a pro-Western puppet. It has a government that's wildly unpopular. It has a battlefield situation that is deteriorating. And essentially, NATO's plans is we're going to send troops. We're going to undermine Putin. We're going to weaken Russia. It's all failed. They have failed dramatically. It's over. It is really game over for this broader plot to contain and weaken Russia. That is what Russia's recent presidential election really signifies it is a mighty and growing power in a multipolar world. It's not going to lose in Ukraine. NATO has no chance of defeating it. And we are going to con continue to see Russia's leadership develop as conditions change. We will see, we will see political changes in Russia. That is what uh, makes Russia different than, let's say, the United States. There will be political changes in Russia. It may not be regime change, but Russia will uh, uh, change and alter its politics depending on what it is what is best for its sovereignty. And that's what we have seen over the course of the last two decades, and that will continue from here on out. NATO has lost, and it's going to lick its wounds in the most violent of ways. So get ready. All right, everyone, I will do one more story here tonight, and then we can have some time to just um, talk about announcements, some things that are coming up. Okay. This one will be about China. I have one more story 
this one relating to China. Let me actually just pull up the sources all at once for this one. All right. I hope you all are doing well this evening or morning, wherever you are. Maybe it's the afternoon where you are. Um, hold on one second, guys. Give me a minute. All right. Let me see. I'm just pulling up everything. Might not cover all of this, but I want to make sure we're ready to go. Okay. Here we go. I think that's it. All right, here we go. We've covered this on the channel. We've covered it many times. We've covered the numerous instances where the threat of war between the United States and China seems to continue to spiral on the course of no return. Now, many don't really consider this or believe it to be such. As much as they have their eyes on Gaza or on Ukraine, these two flashpoints that are on literal fire as we speak. But nonetheless, war is coming between the United States and China. And the perpetrator, the aggressor, is the United States. It's the United States military. It is the Pentagon. It is the Biden administration. And this is now being admitted by the Taiwan Authority government, the so-called local government, which the United States has continuously tried to portray and frame as independent. But nonetheless, we reported here that uh, the Taiwan Authority was hosting Green Berets, U.S. Special Forces, on its territory for the first time. We've known that there was a small U.S. troop presence for some number of years. The Wall Street Journal also leaked this in 2021. Now we are finding that Taiwan is acknowledging the presence of U.S. troops on outlying islands just three miles off the Chinese coast. There's a report. Uh, there are rare comments now coming in response to a report that American forces Special force trainers are sent to Kinmin, which again is three miles off the coast. So it says, as tensions rise with China, Taiwan's defense ministers hinted that U.S. troops have been training the Taiwanese military on outlying islands that would be on the front lines of a conflict with its neighbor. The defense minister, Chi Kuo Cheng, didn't offer details of the U.S. deployment, but said the outlying islands include Kinmin, which sits three miles east of the Chinese coastal city of Xiamen and more than 100 miles from Taiwan's main island. Quote, this exchange is for mutual observation to identify the problems we have, figure out how to improve, and to recognize their strengths so we can learn from them, Chu said Thursday in response to questions about U.S. troops on Taiwan's outlying islands. His comment marked a rare acknowledgement by Taiwan of activity by American troops on its territory. So uh, this is huge, okay, because oftentimes, when these reports come out, nobody wants to take accountability or credit on the Taiwan side. And the United States, of course, is always very vague and it doesn't want to acknowledge that this is a major escalation. And when you have literal special forces on the coast of mainland China, three miles away, that you are essentially, essentially preparing for war, preparing for war in one of the most direct ways that we have seen in this burgeoning proxy conflict. So Chu was responding to questions about a report in SOFREP, an online publication focusing on national security that asserted U.S. Special Forces trainers would be sent to Kinmin and other outlying islands where Taiwan's elite forces are based. Lieutenant Colonel Marty Miners, a Pentagon spokesperson, said he wanted to comment on the specific operations or training. See what I mean? 
Our commitment to Taiwan is rock solid and contributes to the maintenance of peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait and the region, end quote. That's what he said. Taiwan needs such exchanges with friendly militaries because its military, quote, may have some blind spots or shortcomings, end quote. So even just that shows that they are preparing for war. Shortcomings. Shortcomings for what? Oh, the Chinese invasion that even U.S. officials have said over and over again is coming, not coming, maybe coming. Uh, but training by U.S. Special Forces is focused on strengthening Taiwan's rear security, in particular prevention of enemy infiltration and sabotage, according to Su, uh, Su Su Yun, a research fellow at the Institute for National Defense and Research, which is a military-backed think tank in Taipei. The collaboration between Washington and Taipei is primarily focused on quote-unquote defense, they're saying. The outlying islands in Kinmen, where, including Kinmen, where most of Taiwan's amphibious soldiers known as frogmen are stationed, according to analysts at the think tank. Kinmen has been the site of a series of testy maritime exchanges between Taiwan and China over the past month following the death of two Chinese fishermen whose boat capsized while being pursued by the Taiwanese Coast Guard. A Chinese official called the deaths a vicious incident in Beijing, said it would step up patrols in the area. So that's what's happening. So here again, I said that the Wall Street Journal first reported in 2021 that a small contingent of U.S. troops had been in Taiwan for at least a year, secretly training Taiwan's armed forces to defend against China's military and is in building its capability to capture Taiwan in an armed conflict. China's Communist Party has never controlled Taiwan, but considers it's a self-ruled island to be a part of its territory. So there you have it. Okay. So they're trying to frame it as China's the aggressor, China's the aggressor, China's the aggressor. But really what they're admitting to, okay, is that the U.S. plan to expand its troop presence. They're admitting to this. So they say China's been sending ships. China's been sending uh, uh, aircraft on a regular basis uh, in drills. Of course, because why? Nancy Pelosi and U.S. officials have continuously crossed the red line violating the one China policy. But mm, I digress. The point here is they'll go back and they say the U.S. has planned to expand its troop presence in Taiwan to between 100 and 200 last year, up from 30 in 2022. The U.S. and Taiwan have been largely silent on the deployment as they attempt to avoid agitating Beijing. So do you see what they're doing here? Similar to Ukraine, right? Ukraine. How, how often have we heard we weren't involved in Euromaidan? The United States wasn't involved, wasn't directly involved. That $5 billion money from Cookies Newland, Victoria Cookies Newland, didn't have anything to do with any kind of military situation. It didn't. It, and then lo and behold, you find out the United States damn near built, along with its vassal uh, at so-called allies in the collective West, built up Ukrainian's military so that it could, and we found this out from the failed Minsk Accords, so that it could fight Russia and ostensibly continue to assault and literally genocide eastern uh, ukrainian or eastern ukraine's russian population so nonetheless this is a very similar dynamic here what are they saying that they don't want to agitate china they don't want to make it angry but they're going to continue to build up the military presence anyway so in the past china, taiwan has sent its special forces officers to train the u.s but now american instructors are coming to taiwan to train entire companies sound familiar it's kind of what's happening in ukraine or happened in ukraine and still happening. Analysts say Kinmen is a logical place for training exercises, given that some of Taiwan's special forces are based there. You know what else is based there? Just three miles? The coast of mainland China. <laughs> if you're bringing up a training event, you want to train where the troops are, rather than have to take the entire command and move it elsewhere for political expediency. So who cares about the war, right? Who cares? So anyway, uh, they're just going to talk about the one China principle, how they don't really follow it. The Taiwan Relations Act gives the United States the right to arm. Taiwan, but all of this is just, uh, in truth, window dressing over the fact that the United States is indeed, the United States military is indeed preparing for larger conflict with China. And we see this elsewhere. We see this, for example, in other places. So it's not just Taiwan, although I want to underscore Taiwan, but here we have, you know, Vlad, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Antony Blinken, right, warning China against armed attack on the Philippines. This was after uh, uh, China hosed uh, the resupply of a, a downed uh, military tanker that remains in the South China Sea illegally, but it remains there and China has allowed it as long as it's not resupplied. But nonetheless, they hosed the, the boat that attempted to resupply it. And then you have the United States, which has essentially turned the Philippines into a puppet government and has opened up four new military bases there. It is lecturing China 
against attacking the Philippines, right? But it doesn't want to antagonize China. You see that? The Secretary of State struck a balance, seemingly wants you to deter China while avoiding a dangerous escalation. Now, all of this is just, uh, it means it's propaganda. It means it's meaningless because the essence of what is happening is that the United States is preparing for war. And I want to show you exactly how dire the situation is because when we think about Taiwan, we often talk about it all on its own. And it, believe me, it is urgent that the United States is now training you uh, uh, training Taiwan's forces through just three miles off the coast of mainland China. That is a major escalation. But this comes in the context, and here is a, a report back in 2023, last uh, spring, summer. U.S. defense infrastructure in the Indo-Pacific, background issues and issues for Congress. So this is just an information document that is supposed to inform policy. <laughs> but anyway, I'm going to get to a map I want to show you, okay? I want to get to a map of the, you, the basing posture, okay? And he, here we go, because it is absolutely, um, it's pretty damning, okay? So I'm going to zoom out for a second and then I'll zoom back in. So all these little installations you see, I'll zoom in again, uh, U.S. defense sites west of the international date line. So here's the Indo-Pacific, they call it, but really the Asia Pacific. And here are mil military installations and defense sites. These are just select, okay, because there are many, 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 many more that they're not naming. I believe there's somewhere between uh, uh, 80 uh, in Japan alone. Okay. And then of course, uh, South Korea is not so, uh, um, is not so far away from that number. So here, I mean, here's China, right? You have, you have China here and here is just the base. And here's Japan. Here's South Korea. Look at all of these military installations of the United States and Okinawa, you have Guam, Guam. You look at that's a that's a pile. You can't see it, but that's a pile of installations. All right, three here: Air Force bases, okay, and there, um, there's Marine Corps, uh, Corps bases. You just have a, a a literal noose around China everywhere, from the Philippines, uh, all across Japan, South Korea, and neighboring islands. So this is just a snapshot into the reality, okay, the reality of U.S. provocations against China. This is this is the reality of it, all right? Um, the reality is, is that the United States is the aggressor. The United States has hundreds upon hundreds of military installations, more than 100, I, I believe it's more than 100,000 U.S. military personnel across all the different sectors, the Air Force, the Navy, the Army, all across the Asia Pacific, what they're calling the Indo-Pacific, as a tribute to a former policy you might remember when the United States was militarily ravaging Vietnam, they called uh, Vietnam Indochina. So this, was, this is an older term that has been re-embraced, first by the Trump administration, and now the Biden administration, there is no difference between the two in that regard. So there you saw just massive, okay, massive escalations in the South China Sea. Taiwan is a big part of this. And so not only do you have the United States lecturing, but you have this investigation. I want to show you the Chinese side of this. They say that the U.S. State Department support for the Philippines is full of contradictions, which serves to further militarize the South China Sea, a malicious puppet master. And here is a great graphic of the United States pushing the Philippines. You could just insert Taiwan there. You could just insert Taiwan there. And this is in reaction to Antony Blinken going to the Philippines and lecturing China on what it should do in the South China Sea. Does the U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken is set to head to the Philippines to reinforce the American-Philippines alliance through cooperation and security matters following a recent trade mission there by the U.S. Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo? And it appears that U.S. support for the Philippines, is it really 
as well-meaning and valuable as it appears, it may uh, disappoint Filipino politicians. So anyway, the point here is that this piece will expose logical flaws, contradictions, and danger signals and perfunctory attitudes replete in the U.S.'s statements. Some have even been described by Chinese analysts as stupid and counterproductive in relation to the Philippines' interests, and it will be indelible and ugly historical record, an indelible and ugly historical record in U.S. maritime legal practice. So this is the big issue here. This is the, um, essentially the tanker uh, that has is not supposed to be resupply. They resupply. Look, I mean, it just looks out of control. But it's symbolic in the sense. That China says, if you resupply that, you're sending a message that you are militarily um, uh, conducting activity there. So in its recent statements, the United States, October and December 2023 and March this year, the State Department employed a surprising characterization, a longstanding outpost to describe a military vessel the Philippines illegally grounded at Ranai Jiao 25 years ago. Such a description is extremely symbolic because this is the equivalent to making a dangerous characterization of the nature of this territory. It has explicitly exposed the U.S.'s malevolence in its attempt to undermine peace in the South China Sea. The first time that the term longstanding outpost appeared was in October 23 in a statement which said, obstructing supply lines to this longstanding outpost and interfering with lawful Philippine maritime operations undermines regional stability. We condemn the People's Republic of China for repeated obstruction of the Philippines' vessels, exercise of high seas freedom of navigation, disruption of supply lines to this long-standing outpost. Outpost is a military term that typically refers to a small military base or settlement located in a remote or strategic location. ChatGPT gave some examples of how U.S. media sources have used the word in their news stories, such as U.S. military outposts in Syria attack pro-Assad forces. U.S. troops evacuate outposts in Iraq amid rising tensions, and al-Qaeda fighters launch attack on U.S. outposts in Yemen. The U.S. has used the word outpost only in anti-terrorism wars in recent years. Obviously, building an outpost in Renai Jiao, viewing from the country's State Department statement, implies a military action. So there you have it. I mean, I'm not going to read this whole investigation here. I wanted to show you an example of who is actually the aggressor, the United States using language, but not just language. I showed that the United States has militarily surrounded China, and that language is backed up by the threat of force. And this is where it's going. When you have U.S. Special Forces training just three miles off of mainland China's uh, coast, the situation is more serious than even some kind of squabble over diplomatic rhetoric and diplomatic agreements that the two countries have long-standing uh, 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 commitments to or supposed commitments to when it comes to the One China Principle. It's important. China re-emphasizes over and over again how important the One China Principle is because it is policy, because there are three joint communiques the United States has signed, because the United Nations acknowledges it as a key stipulation of international law relating to this region relating to China, relating to who is the rightful representative at the United Nations, etc. But moving for military forces to literally the border of China, if we, if we look at it as a border situation, we look at three miles off of mainland China's coast as essentially moving U.S. forces to the coast of China, to the border of China, well, or the sea line of China, whatever you want to call it. That is a massive escalation of war. And it comes in this broader context. The United States is talking about the Philippines now. It'll be someone else tomorrow. There are reports that the United States is trying to ram through, accelerate the expansion of AUKUS as well. The Biden administration cannot stop its war path with China. It wants to expand. Uh, um, this uh, so-called um, uh, defense pact between Australia, the United Kingdom, and the United States, despite the fact that it has produced nothing. And here's Politico's report on it. Britain and the U.S. race to expand a Pacific defense pact before election turmoil. So not only is the United States militarily surrounding China, not only is it threatening war with China over Taiwan, but it is preparing defense pacts for this purpose, despite the fact 
that these so-called PACs are in a, to a large degree absolutely fraudulent and uh, really paper tigers. They don't really serve to threaten China, so to speak. But nonetheless, they're going to do it. Japan, Japan, do you see what I'm saying here? Japan and Canada could join AUKUS before the end of 2024. They want to do it before election turmoil. What does that mean? Well, the United States political class, its military elite, those forces that truly do run the United States, they, uh, in, in U.S. politics, they see Biden as essentially a dead man walking <laughs> that there is not going to there there's not going to be any continuity coming up in 2024 so here you have the uk us and australia rushing to expand their trilateral AUKUS defense partnership to further allied nations before potentially tumultuous elections in all three countries over the next 14 months one senior diplomat involved in talks told politico that japan and canada are in line to join the so-called Pillar 2 section of the AUKUS agreement, which will see participants sign up for extensive military technology collaboration by the end of 2024 or early 2025. It comes amid fears in Washington, London, and Canberra that Donald Trump could win, wind back, or scrap the AUKUS deal if he wins the November presidential election. Which is interesting because not, it isn't as if Trump is, a, is not a China hawk. He is a China hawk. However, he focused a lot of his efforts on U.S. centric military escalation as well as economic warfare. So this uh, collaboration with the U.K. and Australia, all of that, it will be viewed by Donald Trump as a waste. And and he would be right in many degrees, maybe not for the same reasons as I believe it's a waste, but nonetheless, uh, he would be correct there. The AUKUS security agreement was first announced in September 2021. Its first pillar or part, Pillar One, involves the U.S. and U.K. helping Australia build nuclear power submarines. Pillar two of the agreement allows the three nations to agree on deals to develop advanced military technology in areas such as artificial intelligence, hypersonic missiles, and quantum technology. It was always envisioned Pillar two could be expanded to further U.S. allies with Japan, Canada, New Zealand, and South Korea among those expressing interest to join. A second diplomat involved in the talk said U.S. President Joe Biden's administration was now pushing really hard to get some things on AUKUS Pillar two done now before the U.S. election in November, which may see Trump retake the white house so there you go they are seeking to expand this uh what really is a uh, a defunct defense pact it really is a paper tiger but nonetheless all of it is meant to be a kind of preparation the setup of a foundation so to speak for war with china and that's how all of this should be seen so the Wall Street Journal has been the conduit for these leaks around Taiwan. The United States is trying to use the Philippines as an auxiliary force to prepare the way for war with China. And you have the Biden administra administration trying to prepare the way in these kind of military alliances, so to speak, for that war that I speak about so often. And as you saw, the U.S. Congress is literally deliberating regularly on its military presence in the Asia Pacific, what they are calling the Indo-Pacific. They have formed a ring or a noose around China's neck. Now, will they be successful? Will they be able to uh, tighten that noose to the point where China is succumbs? No, because similar to Russia, China has many advantages that the United States is not prepared to acknowledge. For one, China is a bigger economic powerhouse. It's the manufacturing capital of the world. It is the manufacturing power of the world. And it has economic leverage to a degree much greater than even Russia. And we found out just how much economic leverage Russia had when the sanctions and the thousands started to be imposed upon it, we saw Russia recover quite quickly to the point where it's growing one, two, three times faster than European economies and has become, in purchasing power parity terms, the largest economy in Europe. China, it's already the largest economy in the world in purchasing power parity terms. It also has, if you thought Russia had a consolidated and united population around the government led by Vladimir Putin, China in many degrees, has a government that is uh, wildly popular amongst its citizenry. We have seen the Harvard Kennedy School 
uh, report uh, poll results that show that 90 plus percent of the Chinese population have confidence in their government, meaning that they are very well likely to defend that government should it come under attack from external forces. We have seen no indication that any kind of color revolutionary activity or proxy activity can be successful. There will be no Euro Maidan in the streets of Tiananmen Square. We will not see that because the Chinese population value sovereignty and all the poll numbers, all of the statistical information, all the data show that China's population is ready and willing to defend its sovereignty. Also, China has a massive military apparatus itself to the point where the RAND Corporation, I've covered it here, to the point where the RAND Corporation, the Center for New American Security, all of them admit that a war with China, even if they have this fantasy of winning, because there won't be no, any victory in a war with China, but even if they say they win, they will also report on the fact that the entire world economy will lose, Taiwan will go up in flames, and overall the situation will be very, very difficult for all of humanity. Does that sound like a victory? The United States has a warped understanding of what victory is. They continue to think, these military strategists, these uh, ruling elite the syncophants and parasites that occupy the halls of Washington, the Pentagon, the intelligence services, they continue to think that they're playing a video game uh, where they are going to overthrow some kind of Iraq Saddam Hussein-like government where the military is well behind that of the United States is where its economy couldn't, cannot possibly for survive sanctions and uh, all of the other means in which the United States has weakened and bludgeoned other people's governments over the course of the last 40 plus, 50 plus years, uh, 70 plus years, I should say, since becoming the world superpower after World War II. That is not going to happen with China. It didn't happen with Russia, and it will not happen when it comes to China. China will not succumb to some kind of regime change operation. And so any kind of military to military conflict will inevitably lead, as Vladimir Putin has warned NATO about, any kind of military to military conflict between NATO and Russia will end in nuclear conflict. Any kind of military to military conflict between the US and China will end the same way. That is why China has a nuclear deterrence. It does not want to fight that war. They built that nuclear deterrence when? 1964, well before China's opening up in reform. And why was that? Because the United States had threatened, according to Daniel Ellsberg, had threatened nuclear war against China on numerous occasions during the initial Taiwan Straits crises. And also, it threatened nuclear war on the DPRK. It threatened nuclear war on Vietnam. And also, it dropped nuclear weapons, bombs on Japan. So China had very good reasons for nuclear deterrence. So that is where things would go. That is the direction things are going in. That is where the United States is headed. That is where all of these steps from militarizing the South China Sea to arming Taiwan to now training forces on the literal coast of mainland China, special forces, by planting them there, that is the message the United States is sending. So buckle up and get ready to not just prepare for this war, but to prepare to mount the same kind of opposition that was mounted against this conflict in Ukraine worldwide amongst those who uh, are for a multipolar world, amongst those who are really peace-loving people. That is where, where we need to be. That is what we need to be doing. And we need to have the same kind of fervor and energy as we have with the Ukraine situation because a lot of the opposition to the Ukraine conflict, to NATO's proxy war, has led to the point where Russia's position has catapulted. Russia's, of course, did a lot of that through simply winning the conflict. But we have to give ourselves credit. A lot of our attempts to break through the information or misinformation sphere has been successful. And the same goes maybe to an even greater degree when it comes to Israel and the United States' onslaught on Gaza. So 
we need to have that same kind of energy, same kind of direction, same kind of eyes on this version in conflict with China, lest we simply be reactive and not be prepared for the storm that is coming. All right, everybody. That is the content for today. Um, so here we go. Okay, announcements first. How about that? Let's get into announcements first. Um, next time I'll be live is likely Sunday afternoon with uh low key okay so save that date 1 p.m eastern time maybe i'll go live again on saturday night that would be a stretch um take tomorrow off and then this weekend i'll look at the prospects but 1 p.m eastern i hope to cover all things palestine plus more uh with low key that'll be sunday 1 p.m eastern time here on this channel so be sure to uh, save that date. Um, and then I was supposed to have the Duran on tomorrow, but we had to reschedule. I will be back on um, with the Duran on March 28th, same time. We have time zone differences here. They're out. They're out. In, in all, all of these folks are out in the European sphere of the world. So we're going to have 1 p.m. Eastern time times for that. So the so Sunday coming up okay the 20 what is that the 24th and then the 28th um those are the next two known dates there may be another stream date there as well um so those are the next couple streams uh maybe i'll do another individual between then or whatnot or after then um maybe more likely and uh then you know uh i will continue to work I think I have April 2nd. I have Scott Ritter on. Um, he will be a friend of the show. He will be back on. Uh, so those are the, and that will be an evening time like this one, 8.30 p.m. Eastern, April 2nd. So save that date. Uh, and then other than that, um, you know, I'm going to try to set up things for the times before my trip to China. But then I go to China from um, Sunday the 14th. And I will be there until the 24th. I'm very excited about that. We'll be in uh, Beijing and a few other cities. I believe I'll be on the DPRK border, which will be very exciting. Um, um, so I'll let you know more about that as things come along. But the 14th to 24th, yeah, no streams. I'll be in China doing reports from there, okay? So those are the big announcements for this channel. Uh, I was away. I was actually taking a planned vacation with my wife. I had to, uh, uh, when she takes time off, I have to take time off as well. So that's what was going on. And I was gone for quite a while. I think I was, uh, what was it, the 10th? I think my last stream was the 8th. So it's been nearly two weeks. So it's good to be back with all of you guys again. Um, so. Let's do this, okay? Let's let's do some super chats. First, I want to um First, I want to um shout out. Let me shout out all the Patreon subscribers here. If you're in the audience viewing or chatting, thank you so much for your contributions. Uh, that's the best way to support this work. So you can go to the video description and do that. Patreon.com slash Danny Haifung. Also, you can be a YouTube member. I see that Iranian Putin, Putin has gifted me uh, five memberships. That's great and wonderful. Thank you so much to the Iranian Putin. I do hope those who were gifted memberships choose to stick around. But, of course, you must do what you can. Um, so you can become a YouTube member. You know, Hit the join button right underneath this video. You can also become a Substack member. Go to Substack and just sign up anyway, uh, free, because that's a great way to get notified of the work here. 
you can also become not a member, but uh, you can also contribute on PayPal and buy me a coffee as one time donations. Those are also very much appreciated if you are able to do so. So let's do um, super chats. We have number one fan. Thank you so much. We have Sparky. Go Yemen, fight the power. Yes, indeed, we have Sparky <laughs> with the slogans again. I appreciate it. Uh, make Syria, make Israel Syria again. Those Ottoman Empire days. Levant Jews got along fine with their neighbors, whether they're Muslim, Christian, or otherwise. We have Sparky, more Ukraine. Make Ukraine Russia again. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Don't even leave a patch called Ukraine, lest it remains a NATO playground, carpetbagger, money laundry, and becomes a Black Rock property. Sparky, I appreciate your energy and your uh, contributions. Great work, Danny. Keep on trucking. You too. You too, my friend. Thank you so much. Giovanni Paladoris, $3 super sticker. Thank you. Tim Mayev says, yo, Danny, when you're, China, when you're in China and when you're back, could you tell us some of the Western China myths, like their social credit system? How does it work? Even does it exist? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I've done videos on this. I've had conversations back uh, when I had Brian Boletic on this show. Um. He's also done great work on this. But yeah, yeah, wow. I'll definitely do that. I mean, uh, I'll definitely talk a lot about China. I'll be there on the trip. I'll do some videos just reacting to geopolitical affairs and talking about my trip there. Uh, I'll, I'll interview some people. I'm going with some great people. I believe um, Dan Kovalik will be on this trip. Margaret Kimberly and many others will be on this trip with me. So um, um, yeah, I'll, I'll definitely get conversations with them. Uh, post them as videos. You had, you know it. You know we'll we'll talk about our reactions there. So thanks so much for that, Tamev, 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 Iranian Putin. Thanks, Danny. Thank you, and for the gifted memberships, which we'll get to. How long do you think a war with China would last? Says Mister H. How long would a war with China last? Now that's a question I don't want to find the answer to. Similar to how I don't want to find out the answer. To a war between the United States and Russia. Now, in my estimation, a war between the China and the United States would not last very long because the nuclear question would immediately come to the fore. We're talking about two nuclear powers. There's no reason for either the United States or China to uh, fight uh, a kind of kinetic war uh, without incurring massive casualties on both sides because the United States still has capabilities. There are many factors here though. You know, China also has many capabilities. So these two countries are basically armed to the teeth to be able to, on the one hand with China, defend its sovereignty in the United States to um, incur some kind of offensive force onto China. However, this is a, a speaking about a kind of war without the critical context of what we are seeing in terms of the United States' own limitations when it comes to Ukraine and even, even Israel. So the United States is arming Israel to the teeth secretly in many ways. It has halted its arms to Ukraine. We are seeing its myriad of disadvantages when it comes to production when it comes to the dominance of these military contractors and these four profit monopolies that have a particular kind of model for producing and, and profiting from arms sales and other uh, military technologies. So we're talking about this in the abstract right now, but if we look at this more concretely, whether it's those issues that I just mentioned or whether it's the fact that the United States has an empire to maintain, this is something that I don't think is studied enough and I think must come up more in conversations because it already has affected the Ukraine situation. How quickly did the United States uh, shift its emphasis and military focus from Ukraine to the Middle East as soon as Israel was in some kind of quote-unquote danger, which it wasn't necessarily from the operation of the resist Palestinian resistance. but it sh quickly shifted its point of emphasis because Ukraine, of course, Ukraine in and of itself is not so important to the United States, but its larger conflict with Russia is. So we are seeing a level of disorganization. We're seeing a level of 
uh, kind of strategic uh, discontinuity and uh, uh, kind of crisis that I think is characteristic of an empire, the United States, that is overstretched. It is outstretched. It cannot really stretch any further. But an attempt to wage war on China militarily in, direct, in a direct conflict to escalate this from one of uh, containment and uh, moving it from a proxy war to a full-scale conflict, that would require a major shift in military emphasis and resources. It would require the United States to go all into a situation that would inevitably lead to massive losses on all sides. And that means, and this is what's truly important, because when it comes to, let's say, Gaza, to the United States, uh, there wasn't really any threat that Iran would directly intervene, therefore, therefore leading to Russia and China possibly getting involved, and then, of course, a nuclear catastrophe. Those were fears that we've talked about. Those were concerns that we've talked about. They're not illegitimate per se, but it's increasingly important to understand that the reason why the United States was so um, enthusiastic about re-entangling itself or maybe entangling itself more into West Asia is because that threat of nuclear conflict was not very present, if present at all. When it comes to Russia, that threat was present, but the United States has relied upon Russia's patience as well as the fact that the United States has a kind of uh, uh, policy of creeping up to the line of war with Russia while understanding that there's a two-pronged strategy here that makes up the overall posture of the United States as an empire right now, which is to uh, destabilize and weaken Russia and China simultaneously. So that's why you see a lot of debates amongst the so-called defense community, these militarists and hawks about which is the best strategy to go in. Should it be China? Should it be Russia? Should it be uh, West Asia? Should it be all three at the same time? Should it be two out of the three, one out of the three? We see all these debates because overall, the impetus is not for direct intervention right now. It is for slowly moving toward the possibility that a direct intervention would be successful. And it is my understanding from how the U.S. military talks about China, for how the Biden administration has behaved with regard to China, uh, that it does not believe that success could be garnered at the moment in any kind of way with an escalation and a kinetic conflict with China. Now, they're learning that they overestimated their capabilities with Russia, which is why we see a retreat vis-a-vis -vis its conflict in Ukraine. But nonetheless, the strategy remains the same because overall, this is a long-term strategy that the empire sees as existential to its existence. So how long would a war last? Well, if it got to the level of a kinetic conflict and everything remained the same as it does now, the trajectories of both societies, I don't think it would last very long because, one, uh, there would be massive and intense pressure. Imagine if there was a war with Russia or a war with China. There would be massive and intense pressure amongst the populations all across the world, but even in the United States and the collective West, to not fight such a deadly conflict. I believe, I truly do believe this, that if all things, uh, all the cards were on the table and all things were considered, if there was a massive escalation in this way, uh, the anti-Russian, anti-China hysteria would not be able to keep down people's desire to exist. And that is one thing that we, uh, I think we can hold our confidence in and should be hopeful about is that people want to exist. And there will be no amount of propaganda that can cover our eyes around the potential for a nuclear conflict. It is why NATO and the United States don't talk about nuclear conflict. Norman Finkelstein made this point uh, really, uh, I think, in, a, in, in a, um, a very cogent manner when he was in a debate with Destiny on that Lex Friedman podcast. I listened to that. And he made the point that the Israeli government or the Israeli, you know, the Israeli political machine 
doesn't generally talk about what you know uh, uh transfer or displacement in the kind of way that you would be able to point and say oh yeah no they want to remove the population of gaza or they want to remove the population of palestine out of palestine it, generally it won't be said like that it's about the policy that is enacted which matters and so here a war with china a war with china it would be a very interesting kind of undertaking because it would have to be done with the united states and its allies talking about something else it wouldn't it couldn't be framed as a direct war because if people had war fatigue when it came to iraq and afghanistan and now ukraine that is not going away people still don't want to see themselves foisted into a conflict where they in, very well could die so this conflict could go nuclear very quick it would I, I believe it would be just an intense moment of crisis if it got to this point the world economy would be in shambles this is an undertaking that would truly end the u.s empire and i don't believe china would be under the same kind of threat a lot of people would say danny but the united states has nuclear weapons the united states also, if the world economy crashes, China will be uh, uh, will be harmed dramatically. All of this is true, but let but there's the stories of China, of Vietnam, of North Korea, the GPRK, now Yemen, right? People, people who are bound together by an idea, people who are bound together by the principle of self determination for the hope for a better life, for their sovereignty, for their true political and human rights. People who are in that situation don't just give up and don't just go away. And they certainly are not going to be weakened. They're, they're uh, you know, as we saw in that Washington Post article about the elections in Russia and in particular Belgorod, that people's desire to support the force that protects them and defends them, people's desire to live and to live better, that will continue to determine their political trajectory in China. And so no amount of harm done to the Chinese economy and Chinese society will deter the Chinese people from defending their sovereignty, their political and human rights from foreign interference. And that is why the United States cannot win. That's why the United States cannot win in Russia. It cannot win against Russia. It cannot win really against anyone. It can't win against Ansarella. It can't win against Iran. It can't win against in any of these wars because now the wars are being fought with the last remaining uh, governments, the last remaining societies that have achieved self-determination, that have learned from history, and that have survived the gruesome catastrophe of the fall of the soviet union to um to chart their own destinies and to chart a destiny that in the in the course of multipolarity the development of multipolarity is spreading so really history is on their side so why would china this massively powerful economy with this mass this massive population that is united around its sovereignty uh why would why why would it go away no matter what happens in a u.s china conflict so how long would it take well it could be anywhere from seconds to minutes in a nuclear catastrophe or and then therefore we may all be dead um or at least many of us or it would be what i believe if the, if it were to fall short of that which i don't see how it could but let's say it, for the sake of the abstract be a long grueling defeat for the united states because the chinese people won't stand down the chinese people are just as motivated as the iranians as the vietnamese as the koreans and dprk all of the, i mean just as motivated if not more so better equipped better armed wealthier <laughs> living better more important role in the world uh no offense to those other countries but it's just a fact so all of those factors together point to the united states um having severe disadvantages here and i just want to add one last point to this question and i know i've taken some time to answer this but 
you know, I look at things. I have Scott Ritter on the show, Andre Martin. I have a lot of folks who I, I truly do uh, respect their analysis and, and agree with it. I look at matters also not just militarily because I, that's why I bring them on because they, that's their expertise and it's so important for that to be added here. But my expertise is the political, social, um, and economic development in their in their interconnection. And the military is really a reflection of that. So with that said, China's military, you know, you, you technologically, of course, is well advanced and, and rivals that of the United States. We, we might not be able to say, yeah, it can go toe to toe if they were to fight uh, one to one. But nonetheless, there are so many other factors which, which gives China uh, major advantages, just like Russia. Russia is not stronger than the United States. Russia, the United States and Europe and NATO ganged up on Russia at this moment and over the last couple of years and tried to destroy it economically and militarily by pulling it into a proxy war and leveraging economic sanctions. On paper, Russia should not have been able to withstand that. But because its people were united and because it had other advantages, uh, for example, its political acumen and its sovereign character, all of that played into Russia's hands. Russia did not have to succumb. Russia did not have to come begging. It did not have to bend the knee. China will not will go the very same way. Will not bow <laughs> as Janet Yellen did when she visited uh, China in uh, uh, July 2023. That that won't happen. So nonetheless, a war with China would be a disaster. It would it could last any number of minutes, hours, maybe days. Uh, certainly, the lead up to war will be years because uh, the United States has already been. It's been a decade now of this encirclement of China via the pivot to Asia, and now the so-called Indo-Pacific Doctrine outlined in the national security strategy of the United States, that is going to be a strategy that is lasting and enduring because what we are really witnessing is the fall of an empire. The United States views Russia and views China really as the number one. I mean, there's debates about this. No, Russia is more an adversary to the United States. Oh, it does see China as more friendly, vice versa. No, I don't think either is true. I think the truth of the matter is that the United States is a dying empire and it sees Russia and China as uh, interconnected forces that must be taken down simultaneously, even if there are differences on how that is done. So in the end, though, it is really China's economic might, its ability to be an alternative, and also its continued adherence to a socialist project, which regardless of what you think about that is the case of the United States ruling elite see it that way. Uh, certainly, the entire collective West see it that way. They do see China's both uh, capacity for boundless economic growth to surpass the United States' economy and the collective West and leave them in the dust, as well as its political and social character of its governance system. All of those things put together are the big threat, not to mention that it's a bunch of people from the global South. It's a bunch of people who are viewed as less than human. Generally, how many hundreds of years has the United States held up a yellow peril and mentality toward the people of this particular region of the globe? That is a historic fact. So all these things put together make China just a critical threat to the U.S. empire. And the U.S. empire is in decay. It's economically shrinking. It's stagnant. We hear reports all the time about the U.S. economy, uh, its, its capitalist economy, just not able to recover in the manner that it constantly the most our mainstream media these mainstream economists have constantly talked about whether it's an obama during trump now during biden they all want to talk about recovery this recovery that but the point of the matter is the u.s economy uh the ruling elite is happy when they grow three percent which is and mind you an aberration it's not going to be three percent every year it's likely going to be less the united states has been growing since 2007 2008 at two percent or less nearly every single year and that's going to be the reality. And the economic shock waves of that reality are going to continue to bite people in the you know what. 
And that that's the truth. And that's going to create social, economic, and political tensions that we are already seeing. Sleepy Joe, Donald Trump. I mean, these are all products of the same dying empire. So, I mean, this is where we're at. This is uh, the United States kind of in its uh, last gasp. It's 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 thrashing about, and we can expect that to continue in very violent ways, uh, which will eventually lead to us needing to answer this question, <laughs> whether it's in our lifetime or not. I, I believe it's probably going to be in our lifetime. I, I don't think I'm going to reach um, retirement age before I see this come to a head. What will be the result will be up to us. It will be up to the people. It will be up to the masses of people. It will be up to the people of the world, the global majority to take a stand and say, absolutely not. There will not be a war. The United States' empire will have to dismantle itself or be dismantled. And the future of humanity will be much better for it. Multipolarity will be embraced. And that is that. That is going to be the future of this planet. And all of these flashpoints we talk about, whether it's in West Asia, whether it is uh, uh, the U.S. and NATO's uh, World War III trajectory with Russia or with China, all of them all point to the same development, which is this multipolar world will be the vehicle from which this all comes to an end. And that is why it's so important to support it. That is why it is so important to uh, uh, elevate it. And to um, uh, some people get mad at me here, but you know that's why I'm having low key and others on the show to talk about Palestine. Is that yes, I, I don't cover um, the uh, horrific atrocities that Israel is committing uh, to a significant degree on my videos, not because I don't find it important. I do mention, I do talk about it. It's just that there are positive developments that point to a possible way forward and possibly a way out of this nightmare and i want to be putting in the limited time that i do have into elevating that project and that's why i do rely on others to kind of fill in the gaps so we can all come together on the same side and hopefully in the same place which is a world free of this uh exploitative and genocidal uh, uh mentality and system that is so grounded and embedded in the collective West. So thank you for that question. It got me going. It got me going. You got me going in that question. <laughs> um, okay, okay, okay. So let's see. Um, first, okay, uh, let me just do one more thing before I head out of here. I need to, chat is still very fast, actually. I want to say hello to all the moderators. We have Joe OWS here. Thanks so much for moderating. Do we have anyone? Where Pilgrim, where Pilgrim here. Thanks so much for your moderation assistance. Who else is moderating today? Um, someone say get Jeffrey Sachs on. I've been trying. And I have not been successful, guys. I have tried many times. Um, I, 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 Desert Mantis was here. Um, so thank you so much. Is there any other moderators here today? Uh, I should probably make more moderators, huh? Uh, looks like that's all I can go. I see some members. Robbie Burns, are you a new member? Um, so let me say get Jeffrey Sachs on here. I've tried. <laughs> I've tried. I really want him back on. Creative Experiments is here. Thanks so much. Um, I'll keep trying. Um, I don't know if I'll be successful though. So, um, even though I, I massively respect Jeffrey Sachs and I do hope that he comes back on the program soon. Someone say get John Mearsheimer on. I have tried. I probably need to try a little harder. Um, just not sure what his contact. I've tried certain avenues. I probably should try others. Um, but Nonetheless, um, I will also try that again. So thank you so much. Um, somebody said a moderator is censors. Well, some people um, 
let's just say there are bots, there are spam. There are people who do some annoying things here. So that's really what the chat is about. If you're respectful, um, people aren't going to censor you. My moderators don't censor based on content. But if, look, there's some things that actually do get flagged. And um, we're not trying to uh, <clears throat> accelerate the possibility of censorship that already exists here on YouTube. All right. Uh, Mr. H says, thanks, Danny. Thank you. Um, oh, also, Ali Abunima. I'm trying to get him on. Um, so, yeah, no, maybe I'll ask Ali because um, I have to reschedule with Ali Abunima anyway. Okay. Um, so, Kenji said Jimmy Dore mentioned me. Uh, thanks. Uh, I hope it was good. Um, looking at your comments now. So, Amico Pali, that's a good one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I should, right? I should. Um, you can also email these to me. My email is now on my YouTube channel. So, at least my business email. Um, so, you can email me these suggestions as well if you have any suggestions for me. I do look at all my emails. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, all right, everybody. We had a good time tonight, I hope. I hope you had a good time. Um, I did. Um, so with that said, everyone, here we go. Patreon. Patreon. There we go. Yeah. Patreon is the best way to send me suggestions, actually, because uh, Patreon members get... I do have my email on for, for correspondence. But as Joe said, Patreon is the best way to support me uh, and also communicate because you get the ability. Your guest suggestions are prioritized um, as long as they're you know aligned with the mission goals of this channel, of course. Um, so you know there are some people who have lit a fire and said, "Hey, man, you need to do more Palestine stuff," and so that's why I'm trying to get people like Low Key and um, um, uh. Uh, Ali Abunima, that will happen too. But Sunday, you'll see Low Key on here, and he is. Um, oh, someone said Richard Medhurst. Yeah, um, trying my hardest to get Richard back on the program. I mean, Richard's just a. I mean, he's just that guy. I, I, um, I, I have high praise for Richard Medhurst. I watch his channel actually a lot. Um, uh, so Joe said again um best 20 bucks a month wow joe thanks so much i didn't know you were maybe i did know that and i just didn't remember but uh no yeah uh, you can become 20 bucks a month there's also annual as well annual memberships uh it does help it really does help because um yeah patreon is like kind of the hub where i have a community and um it's kind of like what will always be there. Like YouTube won't always be there. YouTube is not consistent. So if people remain on Patreon, it's just much better. It's a it's a kind of a membership kind of deal. Uh, while here on YouTube, while people are joining YouTube memberships, it's the whole monetization thing on YouTube is so um, just dependent on so many things. And so um, it, it's such a, uh, how should I say, um, strange uh, gig economy kind of thing so so yeah no joe it does help a whole lot definitely and um you know it just helps maintain expand and also hopefully you know <laughs> like for example one of the things i want to do is i want to move into a place where i actually have a studio like right now or not a studio even a bedroom that's dedicated to this or a room Right, that where I can be separate from, let's say, when my wife is home, you know, I can't lock her in the bedroom all the time. You know, it just there's a logistical issues with that. So I would like to move into a better, you know, bigger or just more room filled a place so I can have a place to go. You know, just basic things that all people should really have, um, but really is only possible with support from viewers. Um, so yeah, Richard Medhurst, he's that guy. I mean, I really like him. He um he really keeps his eye on what's important. And of course, his Palestine coverage is um 
is um how should i say uh invaluable so he will be back on the show he's so he's so busy um i'm sure because he does journalism full time and that in and of itself is uh i know because i'm trying to do it more full time and it just takes a lot of work um Somebody said, oh my God, Dan, we never seen your wifey. Can we see the wife? So the problem with that is that um, she is um, she is working usually when I'm streaming. So sorry about that. That's, that's mostly how it's going to be, at least for as long as she is overnights. She also does not really have the camera stuff. She's, she's in a different field. I mean, I used to be kind of in this realm, but not as intense as her. She's more in the union field, uh, nurse. She's a nurse. So she kind of sticks to that, even though she is very um, knowledgeable about this stuff and is on the right side on, on these things as well. So um, so I'm going to say show a photo. I'm like, um, not tonight, Joe. Not tonight, Joe. Joe, Joe. Um, we will. Uh, or you can find me on Instagram at Danny Haifong. You, and I think she's on there. But she she has asked for a little bit more. Now that things are a little bigger here, she's asked for a little more privacy around that stuff, social media, et cetera. So um, I respect her, okay? Um, all right. With all that said, let me get out of here. All right. Uh, let me get out of here. All right. Thanks so much, everybody. Next, yeah, so Friday I'll probably... I won't be streaming tomorrow. Um, I could stream Saturday night, but it's highly unlikely if I have low key coming on 1 p.m. on Sunday. So 1 p.m. Eastern, save the date. Low key will be on here. Of course, I'll blast it out. 1 p.m. Eastern, Sunday. It'll be right before, I believe, um, George Galloway's program. So, you know, if you watch George Galloway's program, you can come on. Um, yeah, you, know, you can come on before and whatnot. All right. Okay, everybody. Take care. I will see you all again very soon. Bye-bye.